Hello, welcome to Interdependent Study, our podcast where we engage in the learning and unlearning work for collective liberation. I'm Aaron. And I'm Damien. Thank you so much for joining us today. Each week, we'll bring something new to the table and discuss our thoughts and feelings about it through the lenses of who we are and where we can go for a more just society. And we want Interdependent Study to be a space where we're always learning with one another. And Damien, you're up this week. Yes, sir. What are you bringing to the table today? I hear it's a book. It's a book. And I'm so excited to bring this book to the table because it's our February book. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we continue to bring a book a month to this little show of ours. Uh, The book is called The Nation on No Map, Black Anarchism and Abolition. It was written by William C. Anderson, who is an author and activist, and he's also written for lots of publications like The Guardian and Truth Out. He's also the co-author alongside Zoe Zamudzi of the book As Black as Resistance, Finding the Conditions for Liberation, which we read last year. Indeed we did. Yes. So welcome back to our show, Mr. Anderson. Thanks for being here. (laughs) uh, but like I said, I'm really excited to talk about He's this not here, book. He's not, here. Yeah, He's not here. He's not here. He's not here. A little everybody. jokey joke. Um, at its core, and sort of in a very broad sense, I'd say, this book is all about the philosophy and concept of radical black anarchism being the pathway to black liberation mm. and how black anarchism and black autonomy is a really powerful way to fight capitalism, state power, oppression, white supremacy, sort of all forms of oppression. And so through this book, Anderson is trying to get us to imagine a world of black liberation that isn't reliant on the state or or the nation state as it currently exists. And his argument is how that goal, without a doubt, I think, requires abolition. Mm -hmm. Which is something I think we can certainly agree with and, and get behind. Yeah. I... I really enjoyed this book, um, and there were lots of great examples of moments throughout history and insightful analyses and quotes from some incredible books and essays and whatnot mm-hmm. that were used to showcase how important and necessary this work is, and I really learned a lot from this from this book. So, yeah, let's get into it. Mm-hmm. What did you think of it, my friend? Where do you want to start? Uh, yeah, this was a great read, and... Reread, having read reread it oh, this right. time because I did read it last year. Right, I think after we read the book that he co-wrote with Zoe Samudzi. Oh, I nice! Read this. But having reread it, still, I, still holds up. Still good. Still holds right? up yeah. a year later. Um, <laughs> so I, I really appreciate his particular vision of how we can organize ourselves beyond the way, as you said, the nation state has developed over the last few centuries because yes. it's a relatively recent invention too. I know that's it's hard to imagine yeah. what our lives look like outside of that, but it's not that long ago that we weren't organized in this way. I think he offers up this vision really succinctly in his introduction when he says, quote, I see the nation on no map as a group of people using skills others may struggle to recognize to develop new thinking, new language, and new societies. I envision a nation that doesn't need to be a nation and that doesn't need to be on a map because it knows borders, states, and boundaries cannot accommodate the complexity of our struggles. Mm -hmm. And I really like this because he's playing with the language here and he's flipping the concept of a nation upside down to describe a group of people who are living in a society that recognizes the shared humanity of all of us and isn't organized based on hierarchy or oppression or all of the ways that the nation state has developed its organization over the last few centuries. Right. It's This is a collection of people who are meeting each other's needs beyond the restrictions that our current system operates on. Yes, absolutely. I, I like that quote a lot for the, all the reasons you describe and, and more. I mean, I think it's this notion of what do people need? Right. Mm-hmm. What do people need to thrive and be well and be healthy and be free? And in so many ways, these quote unquote borders and mm-hmm. boundaries have have prohibited the state from being able to see that and and carry that out in a way that we actually need. Yeah, because the needs of the state supersede the needs of the people. Yes. In so many ways. Absolutely. So that's a great quote from the beginning of the book and talking Mm -hmm. a little bit about what the, I'm glad you said that. I'm glad you brought that up. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should have done that as an intro piece, but that really lays some groundwork about what Mm -hmm. it is that he's going to talk about in this book. One of the things I think I really enjoyed about this book, and I think 
is what makes it such an important read is this book makes pretty clear the imperative that exists for dismantling the systems and structures and and even the state that perpetuate white supremacy and nationalism and and capitalism Mm -hmm. and and how those things were created and designed to oppress black people in this country and so therefore it's necessary that we move past them to something Mm -hmm. new And so in the very first chapter of this book, it's called Stateless Black. There's a part of that chapter that speaks to this. Anderson says, quote, black people seeking liberation present great potential to counter the system because we exist directly in contradiction to the system. Its loss can be our gain. We're forced to survive no matter where we try to escape in terms of class, history or geographic location. We cannot escape our skin. This situation has been dropped on our heads And because we live in it, with it, and against it, our understanding of freedom is fragmented because we have never completely experienced it. Mm -hmm. The black freedom struggle is a struggle because the idea of a free black population is not acceptable to a white supremacist state. Achieving black liberation means a complete rejection of the white supremacist society in its entirety. Mm -hmm. Powerful quote (laughs) in so many ways. And... When I think about that quote, I think the reality is not only was Anderson laying out the imperative of of dismantling oppression, he's also making clear the imperative for embracing black anarchism to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, His argument is that this country has always been an oppressor. And so that is the only way forward. Yeah, and he's talking there. He's connecting the th- the things you mentioned earlier of white supremacy and nationalism and capitalism. He's also weaving together how those things work with each other and are, are in the very foundation of the way that the nation state operates, particularly the United States. Yep. And he's laying out how much it means to reject these systems the abolition of these things is a first step. Yes. He talks about that in a different section where abolition is not the revolution, but it's necessary on the way to a revolution where we are somewhere new and organized entirely differently that is not grounded in the ways that we have been collectively an oppressive country from the beginning. I think that's a great analysis of yeah. that quote. The other thing that stood out to me about it was this idea of Black people have never experienced this kind of freedom, right? right. The, yeah. the, our understanding of free, freedom is fragmented, he says. And mm-hmm. it, it it just is mind, so mind-boggling <laughs> to mm-hmm. think about the fact that we have never experienced true freedom or what the, you know, when we're all saying the national anthem or whatever that, whatever it is yeah. and talking about freedom. Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah. Is that the one? I don't know. I don't, yeah. <laughs> I struggle with that. We, we've never really truly experienced what that is in its purest form. Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. so yeah and i think you know you talk about how this country has always been an oppressor one of the things that he does throughout the book which can be expected based on how we've talked about the book so far (laughs) is that he critiques the united states and settler colonialism and what it requires of the of its citizens Mm -hmm. Uh, so he says quote since the very beginning of the united states the right to land and natural resources and the right to commit acts of violence against people indigenous, black, or otherwise, have been closely linked to citizenship. Mm. To be a citizen has meant to be white, and like whiteness, citizenship itself is an invention that is of no good use to us here. It has done much more harm than good. That's brilliant. And he talks about it in a way that explains how much the United States has asked its citizens to continue to commit acts of violence in support of this settler colonial project. And so the process of assimilation, which all empires asks Mm -hmm. of its subjects, includes violence. Yes, And this violence ends up being directed outward and inward. It's direct acts of physical violence and indirect acts of psychological violence that create a mindset of exclusion. So citizens see themselves as citizens, but they see anyone else as an intruder of some kind who is here to disrupt our peaceful way of life no matter how much the society is based in violence. Yes. We don't we're blind to the violence that is existing here in that the place that we are a citizen of and only see it coming from the outside. And so 
there's another part where he's talking about becoming the oppressor does no good for us. Mm -hmm. I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. I don't remember exactly. But this is connected to that, too, where becoming a citizen of this country that requires its citizens to do self-harm and violence to yourself to change your mindset of who whose life matters mm -hmm. but also requires you to reinforce that frame of mind with actual acts of physical violence too yes. Yes. Uh, when push comes to shove is also not that's not liberation either at all uh, and so i just really appreciated the way that he weaved all that together in a really powerful way to explain why moving towards black anarchy and black autonomy and self-determination beyond what we understand as the state is so necessary so necessary and you talk about it not being liberation at all it's certainly it's it's oppressive to all of us right, right. Yep. um the folks committing the act and the folks on the other side of it but it's it's oppressive to all of us and and I like that quote, and I think it connects to what we just talked about. Mm -hmm. To be a citizen has meant to be white. Yep. And so this idea that black people have never experienced freedom because to be a citizen here has meant you're white. Right. Full citizenship and, mm -hmm. and full privileges of citizenship. Well, and I think, you know, his point is also that's not freedom necessarily because yes. you become part of the system that has been harmful, violent to you, excluding you, oppressive mm -hmm. to you. And then it asks you to do that to other people who aren't in the in group yet. So yeah, major, yeah. major, absolutely. It's all, it's all, it's all of those levels. Yes, yeah. absolutely. That you know, this just reminds me that there's just too much in this book yeah. <laughs> for mm -hmm. us to talk about in one single episode. You could probably say that about all of the books that we talk oh, about, yeah. for sure. One of the things that stood out to me in chapter three. That was called The Sanctimonious Left, which I just love that title. So I was like, I've got to pull something from this. Uh, this chapter, I think, was all about lessons we can learn from our history while also being cognizant of the present we're living in and the future we need. So that's sort of one piece of it. The chapter also presented an analysis of the left in terms of its efforts throughout history, its opposition, its shortcomings just really was a phenomenal chapter. One of the quotes I wanted to pull was this. In a country where taking basic steps to improve social welfare and provide for people in need is seen as radical, the left has been pummeled by the state. Its history is filled with assassination, coups, raids, imprisonment, and executions. The relentless U.S. government has taken countless opportunities to destroy leftist movements and kill the people associated with them, within its borders and abroad. And to me, this quote is situated in a larger analysis in this chapter around how important it is for the left to not lose sight of what's at stake and, and to, to not embrace old ways of doing things and politics as is, and as we've been talking about the nation state as it exists mm -hmm. and what it asks of us, there, there's necessary value and power in this radical black anarchism and, and the mass movement of the left in working to dismantle oppression at, at in its, all of its forms and at all costs. Yeah, 100%. I think the, the other interesting thing about the way he talks about the left is in that quote that you pulled where, you know, b taking basic steps to improve social welfare and provide for people in need is seen as radical. That's really where our quote unquote left movement is in this country is, you know, healthcare for all, uh, Medicare for all is a radical position Oof. in a lot of ways still. Yes. And that's, I don't just, just the reality in so many other places across the world yeah and not the reality in lots and lots and lots of other places. Very true. But yeah, it's just, but for us to be the richest nation in the world yeah, and, and you know, yeah. So it's, it's, it's also fascinating because the way what's acceptable right now is very different in terms of where being uh, left, quote unquote, is because all of that stuff is relative. And so, um, you know, talking about black anarchy is, you know, if, if Medicare for all is a, a radical position, talking about black anarchy is um, I don't know what you call that off the scale. Yeah, left. It's, not, yeah. it's not on the scale. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I really appreciated that chapter, too. And then there's another point in the book that I think connects to what you're talking about, especially in terms of the way that the United States has 
controlled and assassinated people who are part of leftist movements across the the globe, which connects to our the last book we read, The Palestine Laboratory. Oh, yeah. So Anderson said, quote, we must remember that black people are a prime domestic testing site for new technologies of war. The black neighborhood is where the police state thrives, though it's not strictly contained here. And so this is similar to the way that Anthony Lowenstein talked about how Israel experiments on the Palestinians and then exports the results of that experimentation across the world for profit via private corporations that are intertwined with the state Mm -hmm. there in Israel. So we can see how the settler colonialism of the United States matches the settler colonialism of Israel and works together to oppress the underclass that these countries then create so that they can find a new product to be exported, right. which is also how we can see you know, white supremacy and nationalism and capitalism there working together, as he pointed out earlier, as we talked about. That yeah. All of those things are interacting and they're creating new systems of oppression, mm-hmm. new experiences of oppression for the people that become the underclass of that settler colonial project. That's right. You know... I- I always love when our books connect. So yeah. that's a great connection to that. The other thing that quote makes me think about is stop cop city, like mm-hmm. cop city, or even, you know, you, you bring up often the, the war on drugs, yeah. like thinking about all of the ways in which our society, our politic has been oppressive to black people and, you know, targeting of black people in this right. way that that quote, I think connects black people are a prime domestic testing site for new technologies of war for anything. Really black people have been a target for our, this country mm-hmm. um, and even abroad as well. So yeah, great connection to our, our January book there. Mm-hmm. All right, well let's shift our conversation here over to application. So how does, how did the lessons from this book and our conversations about it, apply to our everyday lives and work. I think the application and biggest takeaway of this book, or one of the biggest takeaways of this book, is that even though developing and implementing radical change in our society will be difficult, is difficult, it's absolutely necessary for us to achieve liberation for all of us at this Mm -hmm. point. And that needs to happen now. This book, to me, reinforced that at so many points throughout it. The final chapter of the book is called Ruination, and it has this great quote that I thought fit well for application. So Anderson says, quote, calls for us to abandon state building, including our hopes to reform existing states. This means asking people to reconsider the idea that incremental changes will inevitably lead us to a revolutionary freedom. We have to ask, when is enough enough? The politics of black anarchism are not interested in trying to repair or reform the state. They call for its abolition. And, you know, I feel like we've talked about that notion of enough is enough Mm -hmm. (laughs) before you're in the podcast. And I, I feel so strongly about it. You know, enough is enough. We have to move to a place where everyone has what they need to live and survive and And thrive, not just survive, thrive and and be free. And so that quote to me really stood out as an application of this book and and a call to action of what we need to do moving forward. Yeah, that that quote is is great. My application is this week is for us to consider how much this book can teach us about how to live beyond the state. Anderson offers up examples throughout the book of ways that people have lived beyond the state and how we can adopt those methods. Some of those examples are are, uh, examples of people who were killed by the state or attacked by the state. And so, you know, that's that's part of the history of our country. But one of the examples that he used of this idea was intercommunalism. Oh, yeah. Which was originally developed as an idea by the Black Panthers, Huey P. Newton, which was grounded in addressing the needs of black communities who were neglected by the state. Mm-hmm. So William said, quote, intercommunalism is a useful model of our current world that delegitimizes states and imagines borderless affinities among oppressed peoples while acknowledging empire and global capitalism. This is not to homogenize or deny the differences of black people within and beyond the borders of the United States. It is to say simply that we must reject the futile ventures that have mesmerized black radicals in the past. History is here to teach us not to be imitated and duplicated without our reevaluation. And I think he says so much there about 
taking ideas to the future, but making sure we don't fall into the traps that those folks who were trying to implement those ideas fell into. Yes. Some of it is, you know, reformism on the way to mm-hmm. revolution, which I think we can accept is not a, a viable strategy. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. Any longer. And, you know, so many others. And I think it's just a really important thing of taking the lessons and reevaluating what are the things that were working here? What are the things that are important? What was the core concept here? Does that still work today? And if it doesn't, why not? And what were the things that weren't working, even though the core of the idea was working? And how do we adopt that to whatever it is we're trying to move on currently? Absolutely. I love this idea of learning from our history and adapting to uh, the current system that we see and we have. Yeah. What what are the what are the positive lessons we can take and and what do we need to do to implement it? And that quote to me really speaks to this idea of we're all people in need. Mm-hmm. What but we all can recognize that the state is oppressing us. And so we have to move beyond the state. What he's saying here is we have to move beyond the state mm-hmm. <laughs> to figure it out together what we need to survive and thrive. Yeah. And so that that connection, I love the connection to the Black Panthers and what they were doing because they were in it. And I think they were doing it very successfully in so many ways with a lot of their their programs and whatnot. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, good stuff there. All right, well, next up, of course, is yeah. homework. What do we want to do after we leave this table and in, in conversation to continue our learning? I, I've got lots of homework I want to do after reading this book. I, For one thing, I kind of want to reread this book. I texted you about this sh- <laughs> earlier. My Kindle decided to erase all of my highlighting and my notes mm-hmm. right as I was about to prep for this episode. So that's fun. So I need to reread this book, re-skim it at least to kind of re-put in my highlighting because it, there's just so much here. And I yep. want to be able to easily reference what stood out to me to continue to learn from it. So that's one selfish thing. I also want to read Lorenzo Camboa Irvin's book. Uh, it's called Anarchism and the Black Revolution. Lorenzo wrote the afterword for this book. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like his book was one of the first times a black anarchist proposed the theories and, and perspectives of colonized and oppressed black people in the United States. Mm-hmm. So I would love to check that out. And then as with all of the books we read, there are just so many other great pieces referenced and cited throughout this book. And so I just kind of want to comb through those and see what we should and need to bring to the table down the line. Yeah, I echo that. My homework is to to read and learn from some of the scholars who inspired Anderson in his writing and thinking, like Lorenzo Camboa Irvin, or I may Cesar, or Franz Fanon. Because I think it'd be great to continue to learn and gain understanding about what these folks offered to decolonization theory and black anarchism and how those things shaped this book. And I think other things we've read up to this point that would see the influence and see the ways that these ideas continue to be developed by people over the generations that that they span. And influence our all of our thoughts and talks and things we've read about abolition as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Exactly. All right, lots more reading to yeah, do. I love always. it. I'm always Non-stop. always about that life. All right, my friend, you're up next time. What are you bringing to the table in our next episode? I'm bringing an article from Truth Out. It was written by Nadine Neighbor, which is called When Abolitionists Say Free Them All, We Mean Palestine Too. Mm. Nadine Neighbor is a professor of gender and women's studies and global Asian studies at the University of Illinois, Chicago, and also contributes regularly to Truth Out. This article, as the name implies, connects the movement for abolition of the prison industrial complex to the abolition of global militaries as we currently know them, including the way that the Palestinian people are occupied by the IDF. So I think it's a a great read. I, I skimmed it a little bit, and there's five different important points that she makes connections to how the prison industrial complex is directly connected to the abolition of the military industrial complex, which I think she points out really concrete ones, concrete things that we should all be working on, one of which is militarized police. Ah, yes. So those things are, are directly connected, particularly in the United States, but I imagine 
uh, across the globe too. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about that connection in particular that you yeah. just you just mentioned. And you know, I think we have tried to or have been thinking a lot about Palestine and, and what is happening. Yeah. You know, with this conflict, and so, and I know we've been trying to figure out ways to bring that to the table and talk about that here. So this sounds like a really good piece. I'm looking forward to reading it. And anything from True Thought is always pretty pretty dang good. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to it. All right, well, with that, we want to thank you for joining us today. And you know what I'm going to ask you to do here, but in case you forgot, please follow, leave a rating and review, share our podcast with everyone you know, follow us on the socials, including Instagram and TikTok. Check us out on YouTube and sign up for our email list to get notified about any new things we've got going on behind the scenes. Yes, thank you so much for listening. And remember, it's not about us, but it is about all of us. And we'll talk to you next week. Bye.